I want to welcome those that are joining us uh, on live stream as well. Today we're going to examine um, quite a bit of scripture. And if you look in your bulletin, you'll see a reference sheet. Um, I'm told that that has been a blessing to folks. Um, that you can use that uh, reference sheet to uh, spend some time uh, in the future going over uh, the message today. And today we're going to look at uh, more of the writings of Ellen White, perhaps, than I usually do. And I expect that we'll get a clear, a really clear picture, hopefully, uh, by God's grace, of the message today, Truth's Holy Influence. Truth's Holy Influence. Let's have a, a word of prayer together. Father, uh, thank you for the privilege of being able to come together and pray and read Scripture. When we do that, we claim your promise in James for wisdom liberally to those who ask in faith. We do that just now. And we thank you for the work the Holy Spirit is doing as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture reading is found in Second Peter. And if you would turn there, um, chapter 3, and we're going to read the first four verses. Second Peter 3. And the first four, four verses, this is second epistle. Beloved, I now write to you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. It's been 176 years since the great disappointment. And we saw the anniversary of that just um, a few weeks ago on October 22nd. And that great disappointment, as many of you know, led to the formation of the Lord's remnant church, the church that uh, we're part of today. And those Adventist pioneers, like William Miller and James White and Joseph Bates and, and Andrews and others, those pioneers, they diligently and prayerfully studied the Scriptures looking for truth. And God was opening the Scriptures to them, as was promised in the book of Daniel, that in the last days, knowledge would increase, that men would run to and fro through the Scriptures, and knowledge about Daniel's book and the other books of prophecy um, would increase. And as they studied, they found the truth. And they accepted the truth. And then they shared the truth. And the truth had a holy influence in their lives. It had a holy influence in their lives. So for the past 176 years, heralds have been proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. Rightfully proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. Yet here we are, and we're nearing the close of 2020. And we are scrutinizing current events. Many of us are. And we're restating the prophetic signs. We're telling people, hey, you know, the Bible says this. And Jesus in Matthew 24, he said these things would happen. And look what's happening. And all of these things pointing to the imminent return of Jesus. While at the same time, many people have become scoffers. And they no longer believe that Jesus is coming soon. And you know, the Bible warned in those verses that I just read that that would happen. He said in the last days, Scoffers will come and they'll say, you know, where, where, you know, where is the promise of his coming? Because for generations, 
We've been saying that. Has there been an apparent delay in the second coming? Has there been? There has. There's, there's an apparent delay in the Lord's return. The Lord has wanted to come on more than one occasion. Does it mean that we should refrain from heralding the cry that Jesus is coming soon? No, absolutely not. Turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, and we're going to look at uh, verses 11 and 12. Romans 13, beginning in verse 11, the Bible says, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. It's high time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is 176 years nearer than when we first believed. In other words, we're 176 years closer to the second coming than those that were proclaiming Jesus is coming on October 22nd, 1844. And, you know, does this happen to you? Do you ever just feel impressed? And I believe the Holy Spirit does this of the things of eternity. Do you ever imagine in your heart what it will be like to be in heaven for all eternity? Knowing that all of the anxiety, all of the burdens, all of the pain, the suffering, the sadness, the concern, all of those things, uh, are they don't exist anymore. That uh, the perfection of eternity, the perfection of heaven, the, the greatness of being with Jesus, the freedom to explore, to experience every dream that you've ever had. I, I was talking to Linda this morning and we were, we were speaking about musical instruments and, and one of my greatest desires is uh, you know, to master the violin and the cello. And, you know, I started playing the violin years ago, but wasn't able to continue with it. And we'll be able to realize those things that um, we were, aren't, aren't able to do. Be able to see those things that we uh, haven't been able to see or um, have questions answered that we're just not going to get answered uh, in this life. And, and imagining what eternity will be like. How wonderful it will be. How beautiful. Does that happen to you? Do you ever have that experience? That happened to me again this morning. And, and I'm just thinking, how and why would a person miss that? Because, you know, we make the decision whether or not that gift is ours. The choice is ours. And so, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. And let us cast off the works of darkness. Let, him, let us put on the armor of light. Go to Revelation chapter 1. And let's read verse 3. Revelation 1 and verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. For what? The time is at hand. The time is at hand. How about Revelation 22, 6 and 7? Revelation 22, beginning in verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done or shortly take place, depending on your version. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, verse 7. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You know, in the New Testament, at least 318 times, 
The second coming is mentioned. It is a major theme in the New Testament. That's one in every 25 verses. And Jesus says, I'm coming soon. Time is short. You know, the nation of Israel, they had a 12 to 14 day journey to the promised land. It took them 40 years. And it's baffling. You're just like, why? Why would a a two-week journey take 40 years because of a lack of faith, a lack of trust in God, a lack of obedience to God's expressed will? That's the simple answer. Had they been obedient, had they had faith and trusted God, in two weeks they would have been in the promised land. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 67, says this, The angels of God in their messages to men, represent time as very short. Thus it has always been presented to me. It is true that time has continued longer than we expected in the early days of our message. Our Savior did not appear as soon as we hoped. But has the word of the Lord failed? No. Never, she says, it should be remembered that the promises and threatenings of God are alike conditional. Did you catch that? The the promises and the threatenings of God are conditional. Jeremiah, let's go there. I want to show you um, two places in Scripture that bears this out, that his promises are conditional. The Lord would have brought His people right into the promised land. But because they are conditional, the Lord was not able to do that. So we're in Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning in verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced Turn from their evil. I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Did you catch that? Verse 9. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Very clearly, The Lord's promises and His threatenings are conditional. If the Lord says, this bad thing is going to happen, and we repent, He's going to stop that, and vice versa. If He says, oh, I'm coming soon, and blah, 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 and then we do evil in His sight, we can't count that promise. Jonah chapter 3 Jonah chapter 3, and we're pretty familiar with the story of Jonah, beginning in verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city, a day's journey, so he's in Nineveh. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And this is direct from God. This is the message God sent. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger? that we perish not. And look at the climax here in verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil 
that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. What's Christ waiting for? What is he waiting for? Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in the church. So we're we're talking about why this delay when God's promise is that he's coming soon. Why the delay? He is waiting for the manifestation of himself in the church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people. Then he will come to claim them as his own. Has the character of Christ been perfectly reproduced in his people? No, that's the delay. That is the reason for the delay. It's not because there isn't a Sunday law. Sunday law is not the delay. If the, law, the Lord wants a Sunday law, a Sunday law will happen. It will happen so fast that our heads will spin. What needs to happen is the character of Christ needs to be perfectly reproduced in His people. Then it will happen. Then the gospel will go to every, everywhere. Every nation, tribe, tongue, and people will hear the gospel. Revelation 18.1, the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of God, with the message of the three angels. She goes on, this is last day events, page 39, by the way. She goes on, she says, Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly, the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. So consider that statement when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. So for you and me, for us to possess the character of Jesus, number one, we need to seek the truth. And number two, we must accept the truth. And then the truth will have its holy influence Upon our character. You see that progression, right? We seek the truth. We believe or accept the truth. And then the holy, the truth has its holy influence upon us. See, many will read the Bible and they will read the truth. And then the brakes go on. And they don't accept it. They don't embrace it. And so it cannot have the influence on the soul. So why is our character transformation necessary? Why is that necessary? Uh, Romans chapter 2. We'll look at uh, a few verses to get an answer. Romans 2, 24. And you have these references. So if I go too fast for you. Um, you can look them up. Romans 2.24, it says this, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. So, the Lord's name is tarnished based on what people are doing. And Christians are not always the best representatives of Jesus. And many have said, if that's a Christian, I want nothing to do with it. And it turns people away. And what is Satan doing at the same time? Satan is painting a picture of the character of God that is totally wrong. One of the biggest lies about God's character is that he will torture people in flames of fire for all eternity for 70 years of bad behavior. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that to our worst enemy. And the picture that Satan has so successfully painted in that regard makes us more loving than God. Because we wouldn't do it. Would you set your worst enemy on fire and make sure that he suffered for all eternity? Of course not. But Satan has painted that picture successfully. The majority of Protestant The Protestant world believes that that's what happens when a person dies. If they're not saved, they're going to burn for all eternity. 
Why is the character formation of God's people so important? Because it vindicates his reputation, his character. Psalm 51 and verse 4. Psalm 51 and verse, we'll begin in, we're just going to read verse 4. Against thee, the only. Now this is David speaking after his sin of murder and adultery. He says, Against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. See, the, the character of God is in question. How he's dealing with sin and sinners is in question. And see, Many say that all God can do is forgive sinners. And if that's the case, then Satan and his host of evil angels, by right, must be allowed back into the kingdom of heaven. And that's his argument. But if God can change the character of a person after forgiving them, that's a different story altogether. And that's the vindication of God's character. Does he have power not only to forgive sin, but also to change the person? He came to save us from our sin. Sin is the enemy. People are not the enemy. Sin is the enemy. Second Samuel 12 2 Samuel 12, uh, beginning in verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by his deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies Because of this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So what this is saying is that the actions have consequences that tarnish the character of God. Or actions, righteous actions, they bless the character of God. They raise his character up. They vindicate his character. You know, so many people blame events on God. You know, things, tragedies happen. Oh, God's mad. And we're going to see that as we get close to the end. They're going to be blaming an angry God for the events that are happening. And then we'll have to appease this angry God by getting together to worship on the most popular day, the first day of the week. That's coming. That's coming. And you know, that's pagan. That's very pagan, that thinking. God is angry. I must do something to please him. And that is not how true Christianity functions. God pours his love out on on us while we were yet sinners, right? So it's God giving love all the time. And then what does he want us to do? He wants us to love each other. And in doing so, when we do unto others, we're doing unto him. So he pours his love out on us. We pour it out on people. And in doing that, we're loving God. But the world is thinking and going to think differently. Bad things are happening. God is angry. We must make him happy. Let's worship on Sunday. And that's coming. And that is totally backwards. Um, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. I know we're looking at a lot of scriptures. It's more like a Bible study than a sermon, but um, it's so important that we see this prin- these principles, I, I believe. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness, into his marvelous light. Do you see it in that, in that scripture there? 
God has chosen us to represent Him properly. A royal priesthood, have you ever thought of yourself uh, that way? A holy nation. How does a royal priesthood or a holy nation behave? Well, they represent the king of creation properly. And it says that you would show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Um, And then let's look at verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul or the flesh. You know, he's telling us how to represent him properly. It's very important because if the world does not see the true character of God, how can they make a decision for him? They cannot make a decision for God if they don't know his true character. And he has charged us with with a role in that, in showing the true character to others. Um, Verse 12, same chapter, 1 Peter 2, verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, so this problem was happening. You know, people were pointing a finger and saying they're evildoers. They may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify who? Glorify God in the day of visitation. See, our actions can glorify God. They can look and say, oh, God is so good. I know there's something about you. What is it about you? Oh, you're a Christian. And then they see, they see the character of God lived out in you. Verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Verse 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. That's our example. That's our example. So for the last generation, this character transformation that takes place, the Bible describes it as a ceiling. Not a ceiling, but a ceiling. You get that, right? And let's look at Revelation chapter 7. I want you to see this. These verses that I'm about to read, that we're about to read off the screen, apply to us more so than just about any uh, prophetic scriptures as far as time is concerned. We're living in these first three or four verses. Um, Revelation 7, beginning in verse 1, says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And can you sense that angels are holding back the winds of strife right now? I certainly can. I mean, we're seeing things happen, but imagine that they let go. How out of control things would go so quickly. And then verse 2, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So this perfecting of character, and I know people hate that word perfection, and sometime we could spend some time with that word, um, This character transformation is probably a better way to put it. This is the sealing in the last days. No one will be sealed unless their characters have been transformed. It's not going to happen. So how does this sealing take place? How is it that God can write his name in our foreheads? Not on our foreheads superficially. If your version says on, cross that out and just write in because the proper translation is not superficial, it's deep. It's in the frontal lobe where we make decisions. Spiritual decisions are made here. So how is it that God can write his name in our foreheads? Because God's people are, go to Revelation 14, 
are, they're described here. And, and let's look at this. We'll start in verse 1. It says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, on the Mount Zion. And with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Go down to verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So, this is, and don't get caught up in the 144,000. This is a group of people living in the last days, and we're living in the last days, and we can be counted in this group. God may lay us to rest before the final events unfold completely, but we may be part of this group. But the, notice the description, that's what's important. The description is that they have their father's name written in their foreheads. They have purity of doctrine, verse 4. They follow Jesus wherever he leads. They follow the, follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. They're first fruits unto God. They're purchased among men. In their mouth is no deceit. They're honest in every area. Can God do that? Can God make you or me honest in every area? Absolutely. They are without fault before the throne of God. That's God's grace in its fullness. And we partake of God's grace, and, and I fear say only partially. Because our God is greater than our temptations, He's greater than our sin. But we partake of His grace only to a certain point. And, and many people say, oh, nobody's perfect. And, and we're just not going to, you know, I've been doing this my whole life. There's just no way. And so they're partaking of God's grace this much when He wants to give us this much grace. Does that make sense? Do you disagree with me? It's okay to disagree with me. And we can talk further about it. But God is all-powerful. He is able. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, right? Look at verse 12, chapter 14, verse 12. Again, God is now describing His people. He says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so those two things go together. Don't try to keep the commandments of God without the faith of Jesus because you are fighting a battle you will not win. The faith of Jesus opens up the grace of God and His power in your life. And truth will have its holy influence on us, on you. Maranatha, page 200, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know that it is coming. A settling into the truth. Intellectually, right? Where you use your brain to think things out. And spiritually, in the heart, where you make decisions. Both intellectually and spiritually. There are a lot of people who are very smart about the scriptures. But they're not converted. Jesus called them hypocrites. And they knew the Bible. They knew the scrolls. They had memorized them. Yet, they killed the Savior. So, it's a settling into the truth. 
both intellectually, we know it, and spiritually, we accept it. And then the truth has its holy influence on the life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Prophets and Kings, page 223, to the heart that has been purified, all is changed. Not 90% or 92%, all is changed. This speaks of the greatness of God. All is changed. Transformation of character is the testimony to the world of an indwelling Christ. You know, when you dig your heels and you say, I will not compromise on this. That is dishonest, I cannot do it and you lose your job because of that, that is what she's talking about. Think of the reformers. Now, they didn't have all of the truth, but boy, were they faithful to the truth that they had. They would go to a painful death rather than pinch a little incense on the altar or at the altar. The Spirit of God produces a new life in the soul, bringing the thoughts and desires into obedience to the will of Christ. And the inward man is renewed in the image of God. See, people, Jesus is not walking the earth today. And so they can't see Him except through you. The indwelling Christ allows people to see Jesus in you, in you, in me, in you, in you. And then, they're, then they see Jesus. And then they want Jesus. And Jesus is the Savior. And then they're transformed. And then people see Jesus in them. We can erring men and women show to the world that the redeeming power of grace can cause the faulty character to develop into symmetry and abundant fruitfulness. See, you know, people are burdened with sin. I was burdened with sin and guilt. I didn't grow up in the church. I was in the world for over 30 years. And so I was burdened with sin and with guilt and, and, and in, in, in large part didn't even recognize what it was. And so I did worldly things to mask that, to cover it. You know, you put a little spackle over that hole and just... You know, it'll go away, a little bit of paint. And the world is suffering like that. When you see people doing things that baffle the mind, it's because they need Jesus. Because they're burdened with guilt and with sin and they've thrown in the towel and they just said, you know, I, I, I'm just... And off they go. They need to see Jesus in us. Isaiah 55 Isaiah 55, um, verses 10 and 11. I hope you don't mind that I'm going a little long, but we're getting there. We're not far. Isaiah 55, uh, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not what? Not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper, prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. A lot of shalls there, a lot of promises there. God's word will not return unto him void. It is going to accomplish what he said it was going to. The thing that he, he planned it to accomplish. Now go to Hebrews uh, chapter 4 and verse 12. And I don't know how well you remember my testimony, but this verse, I experienced this verse personally fulfilled in my life and my conversion. Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
And then, you know, it goes on and it says that everything is opened. Everything is naked in the eyes of God. That's verse 13. And then it talks about Jesus being our great high priest, verse 14. And, and then he can, he's touched with our infirmities, verse 15. And then look at verse 16. Very important. Let us therefore, as a result of these things, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And you know, it doesn't specify different types of need. If you have a need, that's the counsel. Come boldly to the throne of grace. So now take, let your minds go to the sanctuary. Because where is the, th- the throne of grace? It's in the most holy place. And we are to follow Jesus there by faith. We're to cooperate with his ministry that he's involved in right now. Where in the sanctuary is the throne of grace? It's in the most holy place. Where does sealing take place in the sanctuary? Same answer. The sealing takes place in the most holy place because in the most holy place, sin is blotted out. It's removed. And it is placed on the head of the scapegoat, Azazel. Leviticus chapter 16, Leviticus 23, read those chapters. And so how does one go boldly to the throne of grace? We do it by faith. And so here is the question as we come, questions as we come to the end. Where are you in the sanctuary? Because many people are still in the courtyard. They're still in the courtyard. Sin confess, sin confess, sin confess. There is no spiritual growth. There's this anxiety, this, this feeling that's just, oh. And the Lord wants us to be much further along. He wants us to, by faith, have followed Him in where the Day of Atonement is taking, a place, is taking place right now, where He is in uh, doing the work of character perfection, um, uh, character transformation. And, and He's blotting out the record of sin. He's doing away with it completely. He is demonstrating His grace at the fullest level there. That's what He's doing. And we're told in Hebrews, come boldly to the throne of grace and you'll get the help that you need. What's the holdup? Why hasn't Jesus come? Because His people haven't been sealed. And they haven't been sealed because their characters haven't been transformed to the level of Christian performance that Jesus is, is talking about. It's what he wants us to have. Because we are to be his representatives to this world. Let's not be scoffers. Because, you know, to a human being, 176 years is a long time. Right? They heralded that cry, that, that cry and then there was the great disappointment. And then God revealed more things to them and then he understood, okay, it's a cleansing of the, the sanctuary in heaven, the day of atonement, okay, we understand that. But, you know, the prophecies of Matthew 24 and Luke 19 and other places, they point clearly to the soon return of Jesus. And so they are heralding that, that message. We are Seventh-day Adventists. We're telling people Jesus is coming soon, but we've been doing that for over for 176 years. Why the delay? Because the people of God have not been sealed. Because they don't have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Colossians 126 or 127. So let's not be scoffers. Let's search the truth of God's word. Get back into the Bible. I don't care how long you have been a, an Adventist or a Christian reading scripture, get back in there, search for truth, and allow, accept it, and then allow the truth to have its holy influence on your character. Remember where you were once? And it might be hard for a lifelong Adventist, but for me, I can remember where I was once. And if God can make the changes that he made, you know, 19 years ago for me, and he can finish the work. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, right? 
Let's not be scoffers. Let's dig into the truth, accept the truth, and let the truth have its holy influence on us. And we're told we can hasten the coming of Jesus. Let's pray. If you're able to kneel, join me. If not, just bow your heads where you are. Lord, thank you that you have put eternity in each of our hearts and that we recognize um, what eternity means, that it means that we will be with our Creator, our Savior, uh, forever, that it'll be 180 degrees different from what we're experiencing now in every way. Yes, there are wonderful things that we see and experience on this earth, but it pales in comparison to what you have in store for those that love you. Lord, we don't want to miss that. We want to be with you. We want to see you face to, va- face to face and thank you for your sacrifice. And Lord, we want to be your fit representatives on this earth. And you will raise up a people in these last days and, you, and they will allow you to change their characters so that we will rightly represent you to a lost and dying world. And Lord, the burden really is on you. You're the one who's all-powerful, and you're the one who's made the promises to do those things in our lives. But we have to surrender to you. We have to allow you to do it. We have to seek the truth and accept it. And then it will have its holy influence on us. I pray that for everyone here. Lord, and if there's anyone that's doubting that that could happen, I just pray, Lord, that uh, they would look at the scriptures presented today, that they would maybe come in and ask uh, to learn more. Because it's clear in your word that you are going to do this. We want to be part of that. We're thankful to be in this last generation. Uh, we may see you coming in the clouds of glory. Um, and we may not see death. We may not taste death. But be translated when you come. What a privilege that would be. But there's a work to be done. There's a sealing that has to take place. And so, Lord, we surrender our hearts to you now. And we invite you to do the work that, that needs to be done. And we thank you for hearing this prayer. So we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.